Chapter 18 White Canoe 1960 Now, every new word began with a squeal, every sentence a race. Tate grabbing Kaya, the two of them tumbling, half childlike, half not, through sourweed, red with autumn. Be serious a second, he said. The only way to get multiplication tables is to memorise them. He wrote 12 times 12 equals 144 in the sand, but she ran past him, dived into the breaking surf, down to the calm, and swam until he followed into a place where grey-blue light beams slanted through the quiet and highlighted their forms, sleek as porpoises. Later, sandy and salty, they rolled across the beach, arms tight around each other as if they were one. The next afternoon he motored into her lagoon, but stayed in his boat after beaching. A large basket covered in a red checkered cloth sat at his feet. "'What's that? What did you bring?' she asked. "'A surprise. Go on, get in.' They flowed through the slow-moving channels into the sea, then south to a tiny half-moon bay. After wrist-flicking the blanket onto the sand, he placed the covered basket on it, and as they sat, he lifted the cloth. Happy birthday, Kaya, he said. You're fifteen. A two-tiered bakery cake, tall as a hat box and decorated with shells of pink icing, rose from the basket, her name scripted on top. Presents wrapped in colourful paper and tied with bows surrounded the cake. She stared, flabbergasted, her mouth open. No one had wished her happy birthday since Ma left. No one had ever given her a store-bought cake with her name on it. She'd never had presents in real wrapping paper with ribbons. How did you know it was my birthday? Having no calendar, she had no idea it was today. I read it in your Bible. While she pleaded for him not to cut through her name, he sliced enormous pieces of cake and plopped them on paper plates. Staring into each other's eyes, they broke off bits, bites, and stuffed them into their mouths, smacking loudly, licking fingers, laughing through icing smeared grins. Eating cake the way it should be eaten, the way everybody wants to eat it. Want to open your presents? He smiled. The first, a small magnifying glass, so you can see all the fine details on insect wings. Second, a plastic clasp painted silver and decorated with a rhinestone seagull, for your hair. Somewhat awkwardly, he placed some locks behind her ear and clipped the barrette in place. She touched it, more beautiful than Mars. The last present was in a larger box, and Kaya opened it to find ten jars of oil paint, tins of watercolours and different sized brushes. For your paintings. Kaya picked up each colour, each brush, I can get more when you need them, even canvas from Sea Oaks. She dipped her head. Thank you, Tate. Easy does it. Go slow now, Scupper called out as Tate, surrounded by fishing nets, oil rags and preening pelicans, powered the winch. The power of the cherry pie bobbled on the cradle, gave a shudder, then glided onto the underwater rails at Pete's boatyard, the lopsided pier and rusted out boathouse the only haul out in Barclay Cove. Okay, good. She's on. Bring her out. Tate eased, Tate eased more power to the winch, and the boat crawled up the track and into the dry dock. They secured her in cables and set about scraping blotchy barnacles from her hull as crystal-sharp arias of Milliza Gorgeous rose from the, from the record player. They'd have to apply primer, then the annual coat of red paint, Tate's mother had chosen the colour, and Scupper would never change it. Once in a while, Scupper stopped scraping and waved his large arms to the music's sinuous shape. Now, early winter, Scupper paid Tate adult wages, wages to work for him after school and on weekends, but Tate couldn't get out to see Kaya as much. He didn't mention this to his dad. He'd never mentioned anything about Kaya to his dad. They hacked at the barnacles until dark, even, until even Scupper's arms burned. I'm too tired to cook, and I reckon you are too. Let's grab some grub at the diner on the way home. 
nodding at everyone, they're not being, a, they're not being one person they didn't know. They sat at a corner table. Both ordered the special, chicken fried steak, mash and gravy, turnips and coleslaw, biscuits, pecan pie with ice cream. At the next table, a family of four joined hands and lowered their heads as the father said a blessing out loud. At Amen, they kissed the air, squeezed hands and passed the cornbread. Scupper said, Now son, I know this job's keeping you from things. That's the way it is. But you didn't go to homecoming dance or anything last fall, and I don't want you to miss all of it, this being your last year. There's that big dance at the pavilion coming up. You asking a girl? Nah, I might go, not sure. But there's nobody I want to ask. There's not one single girl in the school you'd go with. Nope. Well then. Scupper leaned back as the waitress put down his plate of food. Thank you, Betty. You sure heaped it up good. Betty moved around and set down Tate's plate, piled even higher. You'll lead up now, she said. There's more where this came from. The special's all you can eat. She smiled at Tate before walking with an extra hip swing back to the kitchen. Tate said, The girls at school are silly. All they talk about is hairdos and high heels. Well now, that's what girls do. Sometimes you've got to take things the way they are. Maybe. Now, son, I don't pay much mind to idle talk. Never have done. But there's a regular riptide of gossip saying that you've got something going on with that girl in the marsh. Tate threw up his hands. Now hold on, hold on, Scupper said. I don't believe all the stories about her. She's probably nice. But take care, son. You don't want to go starting a family too early. You get my meaning, don't you? Keeping his voice low, Tate hissed. First you say you don't believe those stories about her. Then you say I shouldn't start a family, showing you do believe she's that kind of girl. Well, let me tell you something. She's not. She's more pure and innocent than any of those girls you'd have me go to the dance with. Oh man, some of those girls in this town, well, let's just say they hunt in packs, take no prisoners. And yes, I've been going to see Kaya some. You know why? I'm teaching her to read. Because people in this town are too mean to cho- too mean that she couldn't even go to school. That's fine, Tate. That's good, f- good of you. But please understand, it's my job to say things like this. It may not be pleasant of, of it may not be pleasant and all for us to talk about, but parents have to warn their kids about things. That's my job, so don't get huffy about it. I know, Tate mumbled while buttering a biscuit, feeling very huffy. Come on now, let's get another helping than some of that pecan pie. After the pie came, Scupper said, Well, since we've talked about things we never mention, I might as well say something else on my mind. Tate rolled his eyes at his pie. Scupper continued, I want you to know, son, how proud I am of you. All on your own, you studied the marsh life, done real well at school, applied for college to get a degree in science and got accepted... I'm just not the kind to speak on such things on such things much. But I'm mighty proud of you, son. All right? Yeah, all right. Later in his room, Tate recited his favourite poem. Oh, when shall I see the dusky lake and the white canoe of my dear? Around the work, as best he could, Tate got out to Kaya's, but could never stay long sometimes boating 40 minutes for a 10-minute beach walk holding hands, kissing a lot, not wasting a minute, boating back. He wanted to touch her breasts, would kill just to look at them. Lying awake at night, he thought of how her thighs, how soft yet firm they must be. To talk beyond her thighs sent him roiling in the sheets, but she was so young and timid. If he did things wrong, it might affect her somehow. Then he'd be worse than the boys who only talked about snagging her. His desire to protect her was as strong as the other. Sometimes. On every trip to Kaya's, Tate took school or library books, especially on marsh creatures and biology. Her progress was startling. She could read anything now, he said. And once you can read anything, you can learn everything. It was up to her. Nobody's come close to filling their brains, he said. 
We're all like giraffes, not using their necks to reach the higher leaves. Alone for hours, by the light of the lantern, Kaya read how plants and animals change over time to adjust to the ever-shifting earth, how some cells divide and specialise into lungs or hearts, while others remain uncommitted as stem cells in case they're needed later. Birds sing mostly at dawn because the cool, moist air of morning carries their songs and their meanings much farther. All her life she'd seen these marvels at eye level, so nature's ways came easily to her. Within all the worlds of biology, she searched for an explanation of why a mother would leave her offspring. One cold day, long after the sycamore leaves had fallen, Tate stepped out of his boat with a present wrapped in red and green paper. I don't have anything for you, she said as he held the present out for her. I didn't know it was Christmas. It's not, he smiled. Not by a long shot, he lied. Come on, it's not much. Carefully, she took the paper off to find a second-hand Webster's Dictionary. Oh, Tate, thank you. Look inside, he said. Tucked in the pea section was a pelican feather. Forget-me-not blossoms pressed between two pages of the Fs. A dried mushroom under M. So many treasures were stashed among the pages. The book would not completely close. I'll try come back the day after Christmas. Maybe I can bring a turkey dinner. He kissed her goodbye. After he left, she swore out loud. Her first chance since Ma left to give a gift to someone she loved, and she'd missed it. A few days later, shivering in the the sleeveless peach-coloured chiffon dress, she waited for Tate on the lagoon shore. Pacing, she clutched her present for him. A head tuft from a male cardinal wrapped in paper he had used. As soon as he stepped out of his boat, she stuck the present into his hands, insisting he open it there. So he did. Thank you, Kaya. I don't have one. Her Christmas was complete. Now, let's get you inside. You must be freezing in that dress. The kitchen was warm from the wood stove, but still he suggested she change into a sweater and jeans. Working together, they heated the food he'd bought. Turkey, cornbread dressing, cranberry sauce, sweet potato casserole and pumpkin pie, all leftovers from Christmas dinner at the diner with his dad. Kaya had made biscuits and they ate at the kitchen table with which she had decorated with holly and seashells. I'll wash up, she said as she poured the hot water from the wood stove into the basin. I'll help you. And he came up behind her and put his arms around her waist. She leaned her head back against his chest and closed her eyes. Slowly, his fingers moved under her sweater, across her sleek stomach toward her breasts. As usual, she wore no bra, and his fingers circled around her nipples. His touch lingered there, but a sensation spread down her body as though his hands had moved between her legs. A hollowness that urgently needed filling pulsed through her. But she didn't know what to do, what to say. So she pushed back. It's okay, he said, and just held her there, both of them breathing deep. The sun, still shy and submissive to winter, peeped in now and then between days of mean wind and bitter rain. Then one afternoon, just like that, Spring elbowed her way in for good. The day warmed and the sky shone as if polished. Kaya spoke quietly as she and Tate walked along the grassy bank of a deep creek, overhung with tall sweet gum trees. Suddenly he grabbed her hand, shushing her. Her eyes followed his to the water's edge, where a bullfrog, six inches wide, hunkered under the foliage, a common enough sight except this frog was completely and brilliantly white. Tate and Kaya grinned at each other and watched until he disappeared in one silent, big-legged leap. Still, they were quiet as they backed away into the brush another five yards. Kaya put her hands over her mouth and giggled, bounced away from him in a girlish jig in a body not quite so girlish. Tate watched her for a second, no longer thinking about frogs. He stepped toward her purpose, purposely. 
his expression stopped her in front of the broad oak. He took her shoulders and pushed her firmly against the tree, holding her arms along her sides. He kissed her, his groin pressing against hers. Since Christmas they had kissed and explored slowly. Not like this. He had always taken the lead, but had watched her questioningly for signs to desist. Not like now. He pulled away, the deep golden brown layers of his eyes boring into hers. Slowly, he unbuttoned her shirt and pulled it off, exposing her breasts. He took his time to examine them with his eyes and fingers, circling her nipples. Then he unzipped his shorts and pulled them down until they dropped to the ground. Almost, almost naked for the first time in front of him, she panted and moved her hands to cover herself. Gently, he moved her hands away and took his time looking at her body. Her groin throbbed as if all her blood had surged there. He stepped out of his shorts and, still staring at her, pushed his erection against her. When she turned away in shyness, he lifted her chin and said, Look at me. Look me in the eyes, Kaya. Tate. She reached out, trying to kiss him, but he held her back, forcing only her eyes to take him in. She didn't know raw nakedness could bring such want. He whispered his hands against her in her thighs, and instinctively she stepped each foot to the side slightly. His fingers moved between her legs and slowly massaged parts of her she never knew existed. She threw her head back and whimpered. Abruptly, he pushed away from her and stepped back. Oh God, Kaya, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Tate, please, I want to. Not like this, Kaya. Why not? Why not like this? She reached for his shoulders and tried to pull him back to her. Why not? She said again. He picked up her clothes and dressed her, not touching her where she wanted, where parts of her body still pounded. Then he lifted her and carried her to the creek bank, put her down and sat beside her. Kaya, I want you more than anything. I want you forever. But you're too young. You're only 15. So what? You're only four years older. It's not like you're suddenly Mr. Know-it-all adult. Yes, but I can't get pregnant, and I can't be damaged as easily by this. I won't do it, Kaya, because I love you. Love. There was nothing about the word she understood. You still think I'm a little girl. Kaya, you're sounding more and more like a little girl every second but he smiled as he said it and pulled her closer. When? If not now, then when can we? Just not yet. They were quiet for a moment, and then she asked, How did you know what to do? Head down, shy again. The same way you did. One afternoon in May, as they walked from the lagoon, he said, you know I'm going away to college you know I'm going away soon to college. He had spoken of going to Chapel Hill, but Kaya had pushed it from her mind, knowing at least they had the summer. When? Not now. Not long. A few weeks. But why? I thought college started in the fall. I got accepted for a for a job in biology lab on campus. I can't pass that up, so I'm starting summer quarter. Of all the people who left her, only Jody had said goodbye. Everyone else had walked away forever, but this didn't feel any better. Her chest burned. I'll come back as much as I can. It's not that far, really. Less than a day by bus. She sat quiet. Finally, she said, Why do you have to go, Tate? Why can't you stay here? Shrimp like your dad. Kyle, you know why. I just can't do that. I want to study the marsh, be a research biologist. They had researched the they had reached the beach and sat on the sand. Then what? There are no jobs like that here. You'll never come home again. Yes, I will. I won't leave you, Kaya, I promise. I'll come back to you. She jumped to her feet, startling the plovers who flew up, squawking. She ran from the beach into the woods. Tate ran after her, 
but as soon as he reached the trees, he stopped, looked around. She had already lost him. But just in case she still stood in earshot, he called out, Kaya, you can't run from everything. Sometimes you have to discuss things, face things. Then with less patience, Damn it, Kaya! Damn it to hell! A week later, Kaya heard Tate's boat whirring across her lagoon and hid behind a bush. As he eased through the channel, the heron lifted on slow silver wings. Some part of her wanted to run, but she stepped onto the shore waiting. Hey, he said. For once he didn't wear a cap, and his wild blonde curls wafted about his tanned face. It seemed that in the last few months his shoulders had widened into those of a man. Hey. He stepped from the boat, took her hand, and led her to the reading log where they sat. Turns out I'm leaving sooner than I thought. I'm skipping the graduation ceremony so I can start my job. Kaya, I've come to say goodbye. Even his voice seemed manlike, ready for a more serious world. She didn't answer, but sat looking away from him. Her throat pulled in tight. He placed two bags of school and library rejects, mostly science books, at her feet. She wasn't sure she could speak. She wanted him to take her again to the place with the white frog. In case he never came back, she wanted him to take her there now. I'm going to miss you, Kaya. Every day? All day? You might forget me. When you get busy with all that college stuff and you see all those pretty girls. I'll never forget you. Ever. You take care of the marsh till I get back, you hear? And be careful. I will. I mean it now, Kaya. Watch out for folks. Don't let strangers get near you. I think I can hide or outrun anybody. Yeah, I believe you can. I'll come home in about a month, I promise, for the 4th of July. I'll be back before you know it. She didn't answer, and he stood, jammed his hands into his jeans pockets. She stood next to him, but they both looked away into the trees. He took her shoulders and kissed her for a long time. Goodbye, Kaya. For a moment she looked somewhere over his shoulder and then into his eyes a chasm she knew to its greatest depths. Goodbye, Tate. Without another word, he got into his boat and mowed it across the lagoon. Just before entering the thick brambles of the channel, he turned and waved. She lifted her hand high above her head and then touched it to her heart. Chapter 19. Something Going On. 1969. The morning after reading the second lab report, the eighth day since finding Chase Andrews' body in the swamp, Deputy Perdue pushed open the door to the sheriff's office with his foot and stepped inside. He carried two paper cups of coffee and a bag of hot doughnuts, just pulled from the fryer. Oh man, the smell of Parker's, Ed said as Joe placed the goods on the desk. Each man dug an enormous doughnut from the brown paper bag splotched with grease stains smacked loudly, licked glazed fingers. Speaking over each other, both men announced, Well, I got something. Go ahead, Ed said. I got it from the marsh several I got from the marsh several sources that Chase had something going on in the marsh. Going on? What do you mean? Not sure. But some guys say, but some guys at the dog gone say about four years ago he started going out to the marsh a lot by himself was real secretive about it. He'd still go fishing or boating with his friends, but made a lot of trips out alone. I was thinking maybe he got himself mixed up with the with some potheads or worse. Got over his head with some nasty drug dealer thug. You lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. Or in this case, not get up at all. I don't know. He was such an athlete. Hard to picture him getting mixed up with drugs, the sheriff said former athlete. And anyhow, lots of them get tangled up in drugs. When the grand days of hero dry up, they got to get a high from somewhere else. Or maybe he had a woman out there. I just don't know of any ladies out there that'd be his type. 
He only hung out with the so-called Barclay elite. Not trash. Well, if he thought of himself as slumming, maybe that's why he was so quiet about it. True, the sheriff said. Anyway, whatever he had going on out there, it opens up a whole new side of his life we didn't know about. Let's do some snooping, see what he was up to. You said you had something too. Not sure what. Chase's mother called, said she had something important to tell us about the case. Something to do with a shell necklace he wore all the time. She's sure it's a clue. Wants to come in here and tell us about it. When's she coming? This afternoon. Pretty soon. It'd be nice to have a real clue. Beats walking around looking for some guy wearing a red wool sweater with a motive attached. We've got to admit, if this was a murder, it was a clever one. The marsh chewed up and swallowed all the evidence, if there was any. Do we have any time for lunch before Paddy Love gets here? Sure. And the special's fried pork chops. Blackberry pie. Chapter 20. July 4th, 1961. Dressed in the now too short peach chiffon, Kaya walked barefoot to the lagoon on July 4 and sat on the reading log. Cruel heat shrugged off the last wisps of fog, and a dense humidity she could barely breathe filled the air. Now and then she knelt to the lagoon and splashed cool water on her neck, all the while listening for the hum of Tate's boat. She didn't mind waiting. She read the books he'd given her. The day dragged itself by minutes, the sun getting stuck in the middle. The log hardened, so she settled on the ground, her back against a tree. Finally hungry, she rushed back to the shack for a leftover sausage and biscuit, ate fast, afraid he would come while she, while she quit her post. The muggy afternoon rallied mosquitoes. No boat, no Tate. At dusk, she stood straight and still and silent as a stork, staring at the empty quiet channel. Breathing hurt. Stepping out of the dress, she eased into the water and swam into the dark coolness the water sliding over her skin, releasing heat from her core. She pulled up from the lagoon and sat on a mossy patch of the bank, nude until she dried, until the moon slipped beneath the earth, then, carrying her clothes, walked inside. She waited the next day, each hour warmed until noon, blistered after midday, throbbing past sunset. Later, the moon threw hope across the water, but that died too. Another sunrise, another white hot noon. Sunset again, all hope gone to neutral. Her eyes shifted listlessly, and though, and though she listened for Tate's boat, she was no longer coiled. The lagoon smelled of life and death at once, an organic jumbling of promise and decay. Frogs croaked. Dully, she watched fireflies scribbling across the night, she never collected lightning bugs in bottles. You learn a lot more from a mo- lot more about something when it's not in a jar. Jodie had taught her that the female firefly flickers the light under her tail to signal to the male that she's ready to mate. Each species of firefly has its own language of flashes. As Kaya watched, some females signed dot 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 dash, flying a zigzag dance, while others flashed dash dash dot in a different dance pattern. The males, of course, knew the signals of their species and flew only to those, to those females. Then, as Jody had put it, they rubbed their bottoms together like most things did, so they could produce young. Suddenly, Kaya sat up and paid attention. One of the females had changed her code. First, she flashed the proper sequence of dashes and dots, attracting a male of her species, and they mated. Then she flickered a different signal, and a male of a different species flew to her. Reading her message, the second male was convinced he'd found a willing female of his own kind, and hovered above her to mate. But suddenly, the female firefly reached up, grabbed him with her mouth and ate him, chewing all six legs and both wings. Kaya watched others. The females got what they wanted. First a mate, then a meal, just by changing their signals. Kaya knew judgment had no place here. Evil was not in play, just life pulsing on, 
even, on the ex- even at the expense of some of the players. Biology sees right and wrong as the same colour in a different light. She waited another hour for Tate and finally walked toward the shack. The next morning, swearing at the shreds of cruel hope, she went back to the lagoon. Sitting at the water's edge, she listened for the sound of a boat chugging down the channel or across the distant estuaries. At noon, she stood and screamed, Tate! Tate! No! No! Then dropped to her knees, her face against the mud. She felt a strong pull out from under her, a tide she knew well. Chapter 21 Coop 1969 Hot wind rattled the palmetto fronds like small dry bones. For three days after giving up on Tate, Kaya didn't get out of bed. Drugged by despair and heat, she tossed in clothes and sheets, damp from sweat, her skin sticky. She sent her toes on missions to scouts for for cool spots between the sheets, but they found none. She didn't note the time of moonrise or when a great horned owl took a diurnal dive at a blue jay. From bed she heard the marsh beyond it, beyond in the lifting of blackbirds' wings, but didn't go for it. She heard from the crying songs of gulls above the beach calling to her, but for the first time in her life did not go to them. She hoped the pain from ignoring them would displace the tear in her heart. It did not. Listless, she wondered what she had done to send everyone away. Her own ma, her sisters, her whole family, Jody, and now Tate? Her most poignant memories were unknown dates of family members disappearing down the lane. The last of a white scarf trailing through the leaves, a pile of socks left on a floor mattress. Tate and life and love would be the same thing. Now there was no Tate. Why, Tate? Why? She mumbled into the sheets. You were supposed to be different. To stay. You said you loved me. But there is no such thing. There is no one on this earth you can count on. From somewhere very deep, she made herself a promise never to trust or love anyone again. She'd always found the muscle and heart to pull herself from the mire, to take the next step, no matter how shaky. But where had all that grit brought her? She drifted in and out of thin sleep. Suddenly, the sun, full, bright and glaring, struck her face. Never in her life had she slept until midday. She heard a soft rustling sound and, raising herself onto her elbows, saw a raven-sized Cooper's hawk standing on the other side of the screen door, peering in. For the first time in days, an interest stirred in her. She roused herself as the hawk took wing. Finally, she made a mush of hot water and grits and headed to the beach to feed the gulls. When she broke onto the beach, all of them swirled and dived in in flurries and she dropped to her knees and tossed the food on the sand. As they crowded around her, she felt their feathers brushing her arms and thighs and threw her head back, smiling with them, even as tears streamed down her cheeks. For a month after July 4, Kaya did not leave her place, did not go to the marsh or to Jumpins for gas or supplies. She lived on dried fish, mussels, oysters, grits and greens. When all her shells were empty, She finally motored to Jumpin's for supplies, but didn't chat to him as usual, did her business and left him standing, staring at her. Needing Needing people ended in hurt. A few mornings later, the Cooper's hawk was back on her steps, peering at her through the screen. How odd, she thought, cocking her head at him. Hey, Coop. With a little hop, he lifted, made a flyby, then soared high into the clouds. Watching him at last, Kaya said to herself, I have to get back to the marsh. And she took the boat out, easing along the channels and slipstreams, searching for birds' nests, feathers or shells from the first time since since Tate abandoned her. 
Even so, she couldn't avoid thoughts of him. The intellectual fascinations or the pretty girls of Chapel Hill had drawn him in. She couldn't imagine college wo- she couldn't imagine college women, but whatever form they took would be better than a tangle haired, barefoot muscle monger who lived in a shack. By the end of August her life once more found its footing. Boat, collect, paint. Months passed. She only went to Jumpins when low supplies demanded, but spoke very little to him. Her collections matured, categorised methodically by order, genus and species, by age according to bone wear, by size in millimetres of feathers, or by the most fragile hues of greens. The science and art intertwined with each other's strengths, the colours, the light, the species, the life, weaving a masterpiece of knowledge and beauty that filled every corner of her shack, her world. She grew with them, the trunk of the vine, alone, but holding all the wonders together. But just as her collection grew, so did her loneliness. A pain as large as her heart lived in her chest. Nothing eased it, not the gulls, not a splendid sunset, not the rarest of shells. Months turned into a year. The lonely became larger than she could hold. She wished for someone's voice, presence, touch, but wished more to protect her heart. Months passed into another year, then another.